Hello, I'm Ros Goldstein. I run Goldstein Legal Limited, which is a specialist franchise law firm, and I'm proud to be a member of the board of the British Franchise Association. Once you have established your franchise system and you're ready to start recruitment, you need to start thinking about some of the additional agreements that you're going to need over and above your franchise agreement. For each of the agreements that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to explain to you what it is, why you need it, and when's the best moment to get it signed. So let's start with your confidentiality agreement. You may sometimes hear this being referred to as a non-disclosure agreement or an NDA. But no matter what it's called, it has one very important job, and this is to protect the confidentiality of your system. The confidentiality agreement may very likely be the first legal document that your prospective franchisee is given. So it's going to help if it's user-friendly and easy to read. You can decide for yourself when the moment is right to give your franchisee the confidentiality agreement. But the most important thing is that you get it signed before you give out any commercially sensitive information about your system and most particularly before you give your franchisee any sales forecasts or tell them anything about likely financial performance or before you allow them to speak to your other franchisees. Remember, at this stage, your prospect is still window shopping. He or she may still be weighing up your concept against other business opportunities. So if you wouldn't want one of your competitors to know something, don't tell a prospective franchisee about it until they've signed a confidentiality agreement. So most likely, the right moment for your confidentiality agreement is going to be after your potential franchisee has already had some information about your system, which effectively is publicly available, so for example your franchise marketing materials, and you feel like they may be a good fit for your business and they seem keen, but you now need to give them more information in order to move things forward. Once the confidentiality agreement is signed, it will protect your confidential information indefinitely. It will effectively be superseded by your franchise agreement as and when it gets signed. But if for any reason the franchisee does not proceed, this confidentiality agreement protects your information and prevents anyone from commercially exploiting it. Now the next legal document you need is your deposit agreement. This addresses the initial deposit that you will expect a potential franchisee to pay you before they are given their franchise agreement. If you will be giving your franchisees exclusive territories, then the deposit agreement will secure that specific territory that you've identified. The deposit agreement will hold that territory for the franchisee for a specified period of time. In terms of the timing of your deposit agreement, it may be signed at the same time as the confidentiality agreement, or it may work better for you if it's signed later. There's no hard and fast rule. A typical scenario would be, you've decided that your prospect franchisee meets your criteria, he or she is poised to go ahead, but they still need to get some funding in place, or maybe get a business plan approved by their bank, or maybe they need to do some final checks. So that is the best moment to take a deposit from them and get the deposit agreement signed. It's up to you how much of a deposit you want to take at this stage. Something in the region of 25 to 30% of the initial fee would be quite typical. If your franchisee then enters into their franchise agreement, the deposit is offset against the balance of the initial fee that they're then due to pay you. But if for any reason they decide not to proceed, then the British Franchise Association will expect you to refund the deposit, but less your actual out-of-pocket expenses that you've incurred up to that point as part of the recruitment process. Moving on to trademarks now. As you will already have heard, 
you must have a registered trademark in order to run a franchise. Do remember that this may mean that you need to have a trademark license in place in addition to your franchise agreement. And in fact, this is quite often the case. It's very common for a new franchisor to set up a separate legal operating entity to be the franchisor under its franchise agreements. There are various tax and accounting reasons why this often works best. But often this will turn out not to be the entity that you originally registered as the owner of your trademark. Your franchisor legal entity in your franchise agreement must have a legal right to use your business trademark and that must be obvious from your franchise agreement. If the ownership isn't in the right place, it sets you off on the wrong foot entirely. You will want to be encouraging franchisees to get their franchise agreement reviewed by a BFA affiliated franchise lawyer. Now, if your trademark is not owned by your franchise or entity, the lawyer acting for the franchisee will spot this. So in order to look professional and well organized, you don't want to get caught out with this. There are a couple of solutions. The easiest is an intragroup license agreement. In other words, whichever entity owns the trademark, whether it's you personally or one of your limited companies, they grant a license to the franchisee to use the mark. You can put a copy of this license with your franchise agreement and that makes it clear that you have covered the issue. Looking forward into the future now, to the point where your franchise system is well established and you are looking for ways to accelerate your business growth. At this point, you may want to think about putting a development agreement in place. Now, a development agreement gives a franchisee the right to open several outlets. This may be a brand new franchisee, perhaps somebody who has experience in your particular sector, or it could be one of your existing franchisees who has been operating successfully for a time and is now ready to expand their business and run a number of sites. A development agreement typically, but not always, gives a franchisee development rights in relation to a specified area. When a franchisee enters into a development agreement, they will typically pay you an upfront fee for it. Now, as they have effectively paid in advance, you may agree to give them a discount on the initial fees that they will be paying you later as and when each of their sites opens. This can represent a good deal for the franchisee, but note that in return, the franchisee will be committing to hit a target number of openings over a specified period in order to retain their development rights. And those targets may be quite challenging. If they don't achieve the targets, then they risk losing their territory rights and the franchisee won't ordinarily get their money back. So they are incentivized to develop their territory to the best of their abilities. We have a lot of initial conversations with our applicants and then before they come to meet me at head office for their first face-to-face -face meeting, they are sent a confidentiality agreement via email which they read and we ask them to sign before meetings can start. We use a deposit agreement to ensure that everybody understands the terms and the ways that the deposit is being used. A franchise agreement tends to be a standard format and we would recommend to all of our franchisees who are applying for a Monkey Music franchise that they use a lawyer that's affiliated to the BFA for their own independent advice. We find the confidentiality agreement really important, so we give it to them right at the beginning of our first interaction, um, whether that's by a phone call or face-to-face. -face. So yes, we do use a deposit agreement. Um, as I mentioned previously, we get our franchisees to put together a professional business plan, and part of this deposit pays for that. The second thing, and maybe one of the most important things, is it shows they are committed. Because if they're not willing to go through that process, we need to question how committed are they to this mutual evaluation process. 
Have we ever negotiated on the terms of our franchise agreement? Never. <laughs> a deposit when a franchisee comes along can be really useful because um, it shows a level of commitment um, uh, to the, the, the business. Um, there are times when people are interested but don't want to take that, that final step or find it really difficult and so having a deposit can find out um, who are the people who are really worthwhile spending time with and who are committed to making the business work. Occasionally we get people who ask us about certain clauses in the agreement who want to negotiate terms and um, the short answer to uh, do we negotiate on franchise agreements is no. Um, the answer we often give is what part of the support, what part of the training don't you want? Now, having said that, there are times that people come into the business with certain skills, perhaps with um, a body shop background or something, and they may not need all the technical training. So um, if they are at a level, then it seems um, uh, silly to make them go through uh, training that they don't need. But the short-term answer for do we negotiate on the franchise is no.